Okay, so I'm assuming that you can hear me. All right, inshallah. So we're going to begin. We are live. If you could uh, please put on verse number 27. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa abtul salati wa atamu taslim ala Sayyidina Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Welcome back, everyone, to class five, Tafsir Surah Hud, Tears of Love. Uh, so for those of, us, uh, those of you that are joining us, uh, alhamdulillah, we have um, the translation provided for you. I don't know if everyone was following along with the Mus'haf, with the translation, but you have it on the screen today, inshallah. So I hope that this will help, especially with the word to word, okay? So today we are on class five uh, for Tafsir Surah Hud. I hope everyone has caught up uh, to all of the classes, inshallah. I want everyone to get the certificate this time, inshallah. I'm aiming for 100% uh, certificates, inshallah, for all of you. Okay, so let's go to verse number 27, which we had actually started last week, but we did not complete, okay? So we had done the word to word translation, so I'm just going to give the uh, Arabic and the uh, English, inshallah. We won't do word to word. Verse 27. The elders among Nuh's own people would refuse to follow him responded, We see you as merely a human being like ourselves, nor do we find among those who follow you except the lowliest of our folk, those who follow you without any proper reason. We see nothing in you to suggest that you are any better than us, rather we believe you to be liars, okay? So we had mentioned how the first to reject the call of the messengers were unfortunately the leaders and the chiefs of the people. And that's almost counterintuitive in one aspect, but understandable in another aspect. It's counterintuitive in the sense that if you're the leader of your community, you should be the most sensible, you should be uh, the most truth recognizing, uh, you should have that wisdom and foresight to see the truth of the message or to see the truth, period, uh, when it is presented before you. But this was not the case. And why was it not the case? Because the other part of leadership and affluence is exactly that wealth and that social status, which becomes like a, a fetter or a chain or something that limits you. You have more strings attached to dunya, so it's harder to let go of that and submit to uh, the call of the messenger, which um, of course demands, you know, uh, changes at uh, many levels, especially for the mala, especially for the elite, the ruling class, the leaders. So unfortunately, this is a theme we see over and over again throughout history, that it is the mala, the leaders and the chiefs, the most affluent, most blessed people, ironically, of the times that reject Allah's message. And one of the things that you're going to see um, in the thought process of these individuals we want to look at their thought process to see how they went wrong. They were so skilled from a worldly perspective to lead their people, perhaps, right? But they went wrong. They destroyed their akhirah because of how they were thinking, okay? So this, again, uh, is a theme I highlight over and over again throughout our tafsir classes, how important it is to think properly. If you are not thinking properly, you cannot act properly and you cannot get to your destination in dunya or akhirah without correct quranic thinking so one of the ways they went wrong was in their presumptions because one of the first baseless reasons for their doubts against Nuh is that you're just a messenger so they had this assumption that a messenger has to be non-human has to be angelic right so where did this assumption come from it was a concoction of their own mind right they felt that no it's not possible for the lowly human race to be entrusted with god's message but as we had mentioned last time sheikh saadi in his tafsir uh, he says that in fact the human being is the most suitable individual or, or more suitable being to convey the message of god because he is a person among the people that uh, you know, can be a source of reference for people when they need to ask questions or uh, seek clarification on a matter. Uh, you need to be able to access someone in order to derive benefit 
uh, from that individual and become enlightened with regards to the revelation. Uh, angels don't have to, you know, they have a completely different realm. Uh, they don't go through the things that human beings go through. So the human being, the human messenger is the perfect uh, way to show how Allah's revelations and commands are uh, practical, are doable, and are uh, for the benefit of the human being. So he's the perfect model. The human messenger is the perfect way to model and convey the message. And Maududi Rahimallah Ta'ala, he mentions how the same foolish objection was being raised by the people against the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would say, you are a man like us, eat, drink, you walk and sleep, you have a family. There's nothing in you that might show that you've been sent by God. So, you know, if you want to not believe, you will always be able to find a reason to not believe. If you want to not submit to the truth, if you want to keep doing the wrong thing, you will always find a way to justify it. This is the opposite of submission, right? And I was reading uh, this morning, um, uh, Brother Khurra Murad, ta'ala, his book on sacrifice. And one of the things he said was that being Muslim requires becoming Muslim. I'm going to repeat that. He says, being Muslim requires becoming Muslim. And I, and I love that statement. It's not enough to be born into Islam and be satisfied that we're eventually going to be taken to paradise or eventually going to be saved. Who does that sound like? That sounds like the Christian belief of, you know, just love Jesus, believe in Jesus, and you will be saved. Allah Panther requires, along with Iman, He requires action. The two are never separated uh, in the Quran in describing believers who get into Jannah. Amanu wa amanu salihat, right? So this, uh, these righteous actions are uh, you know, they are the material that gets uh, one into Jannah, right? They are the way uh, by Allah's permission to get into paradise. And a lot of it requires becoming Muslim, yani submitting yourself, giving up your will. If and someone asks you, you know, who is a Muslim? What is a Muslim? In the simplest terms, you can explain to them, a Muslim is someone who has given up or surrendered their own will to the will of God. For a Muslim, the commands of Allah, his orders, his prohibitions are more beloved, are more important than their own desires, their own wishes. Okay, so submitting the process, and this is a something we struggle with, right, throughout our lives. Uh, we, Although we're born Muslim, inshallah, we uh, hope to die Muslim. And Allah says, do not die except as Muslims. But until the very end, throughout our lives, it is something we are constantly trying to perfect our level of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see this, uh, subhanAllah, at, at its greatest levels in Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, and if you were in our series, Befriended by God, you see how beautiful he is because of the way he rose in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where it looks like from his life, no test was too big. No sacrifice was too great that you could ask Ibrahim Islam to make and he would make it, right? Um, so the lesson here, going back to Nuh Salam's people and the presumptions that, uh, the assumptions that they had, which they made a basis for rejecting him, how does that relate to us? Because we don't reject or doubt our messengers, alhamdulillah. We are not in that situation. We fully... Uh, are inshallah firm in our belief in the uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But the lesson we extract from this is we don't get to dictate the terms when it comes to obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't say I'll wear hijab when I'm ready to wear hijab. We don't say I'll start praying later, I'm not ready yet, or I'll repent when I'm older. We don't worship Allah on our terms. Our job on this earth before our time is up before that, you know, the timer is on. For every single one of us, the timer until death is on. And every second is decreasing that timer. And we want to rack up as many points uh, as hasanat as we can. So we don't have this luxury of later, okay? Uh, there's, there's no guarantee for later. And the second thing that the people of Nuh Salam were deluded by um, was, was their delusion on account of the type of people that followed 
um, Nuh alayhi So what we're doing right now for this verse number 27 is identifying the reasons, the psychology, the mindset of how they and why they rejected Nuh alayhi So the first thing is this presumption, you have to be angelic or non-human to be a messenger. Since you're a human being, we don't accept you. Number two, look at the people that are following you, Nuh. They're the poor, the lowly, you know, the ones who have no clout, no power, no position or influence or weight in society. You know, if there was going to be a, um, a messenger, um, he should have been, you know, uh, it should have been someone who had, you know, a clout in society, right? Someone who was more forceful, uh, someone who was in a position that no one could have rejected his call, right? So this is um, one of the one of the objections was that you have people following you that are among the lowly, lowliest of the people, right? So actually, this is um, so. Let's backtrack. Let's clarify a little bit. They said to the they said to Nuh alayhi salam that if you were really presenting the truth, then the elders of the community would have hearkened to your call. If you were really upon the truth, why would the um, poorest people who don't have sound intellect, who just follow whatever they are told, who just follow the first thing that they hear, they're the ones that are following you, right? So why would uh, we follow the people who have the, um, you know, who have the most feeble minds? So this is one of the reasons that they gave Nuh alayhi salam, right? Is that we are not going to follow the same thing that the most feeble-minded, the uh, the ones with the least intelligence, referring to the poor uh, class, uh, the poor people, we're not going to follow the same thing they have followed because if it was the truth, then we who are the elders and the leaders would have recognized it to be the truth because we have superior intellect. So you see how um, a superior, a thinking highly of yourself is also one of the tunes of shaitan uh, because you can miss uh, assess so much of reality if you're so impressed by your own self it creates so many blind spots and here we see those blind spots were before the truth of nu right so um ibn kathir also mentions this that uh, they were saying to know that you know the people who followed you they followed you without thinking they just followed the first thing that was presented uh to them the first thing that came to their uh mind and so these are undiscerning people yani they're unable to distinguish between right and wrong so we are not going to be like them because we are mentally more powerful than them so we're not going to fall for the same thing that you made these people or these people fell for right so you see it's a highly condescending attitude um, and their self ujub their self admiration of this mala of this ruling class of leaders uh, in the community of Nuh alayhi salam that that their self admiration for their own selves this condescending attitude towards the poor believers on account of their self admiration they could not see what was in front of them they could not visualize the true nobility that these people embodied just because they were poor right and subhanAllah, I was listening to a lecture about this, how even nowadays, the poor people have, uh, the rich people rather, have a, you know, a, a different um, a set, a different lifestyle from the poor people, right? They live in different neighborhoods, they eat different types of food, uh, even their travel um, on air aircraft, for example, is in a different class, right? The first class or the business class. Um, so really, the world of the rich is literally different from the world of the poor. Uh, but subhanAllah, some of the uh, Sahaba would not eat until there was a poor person that they would find and bring and make them sit next to them and eat with them. And this is one of the things we have to strive to um, embody in ourselves is to never ever make a distinction uh, or, uh, or you know, change the way we treat someone because they are poor, or they have no clout, or they have, or they're homeless, or they have no uh, position in society. Uh, because most of the time, historically, it has been the poor uh, people who have uh, no fame or name in society that have great name with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that are beloved to Him. So um, 
this low status, if you think about it, if you think about the low status of the poor that had followed Nuh alayhi salam, that low status, in fact, had liberated them, had enabled them to accept the truth because they were not bogged down by their interests of having to maintain social appearances. Um, their nature had not been corrupted by power. They naturally found appeal in a message that dignified them by providing them a direct relationship with their creator. So look at how liberating and enriching their poverty really became, subhanAllah. Um, was it to mention some of these points so the lesson is that do not be deluded by the few uh fewness by the minority uh, of the people on the straight path or nor by their poor status nor by their unpopularity in society remember historically prophets and their followers have been highly unpopular in their societies they they don't follow the trends that are around them they follow divine guidance they don't do what everyone else is doing. They were different. And uh, we know the hadith about the ghuraba, right? That Islam began as something strange, will return as something strange. So glad tidings to the strangers. So we should never, ever be shy of being the oddball, of being, you know, uh, looked upon as strange, weird, different uh, in our society. Because the prophets were always viewed like this. Even though Rasul had lived amongst his people for 40 years, they knew him. He had grown up among them. He was the most trustworthy of them. He spoke the same language. He was not from a foreign country, right? He was always there in Mecca with them. He wore the same clothes. He ate the same food, subhanAllah. But as soon as he started preaching the truth, as soon as he started uh, you know, telling them to submit to the call of one God, he became a stranger. They ex, ex you know, they basically evicted him in, in a sense that he had to make the hijrah, right? SubhanAllah. So if this is the case of the one who was called Amin till yesterday, was never a foreigner or an immigrant, never had a different language or a different way of dressing, yet he became a stranger, then if we become strangers in this land, and most of us do come, you know, some of us may come from other countries, you know, we do dress differently our foods are also different so if we are being uh, are looked upon as um, people that are strange on account of their beliefs and practices and way of dressing then say alhamdulillah that i share something with the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam that i am alhamdulillah you know in the best company if there is something similar that i'm going through that the rasul went through. So don't be a blind trend follower. Be a trend setter. Think differently. Don't think like everyone else thinks around you in our society. Think according to the Quran. Think according to uh, our the Quranic paradigm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us. Okay, the, the third thing about this um, verse is Something I kind of alluded to is the lack of power, the lack of affluence of Nuh alayhi salam himself. This is also one of the objections that they had against uh, Nuh alayhi salam, right? Um, so they saw Nuh alayhi salam as, you know, you have nothing over us. You know, why should we listen uh, to you? We don't see any type of fadl, any type of superiority uh, that you and the believers, you know, have over us. They see nothing in the believers, the rights, that makes them more likely to be right or follow proper guidance. Had the message been right and good, they would have seen it for what it was and accepted it without allowing those who are lowly, the poor, to have beaten them to it, right? So the so they used their the fact that the message did not appeal to them as a proof of the falsehood of the message. Because we are too smart to not see the truth if it had been the truth, and therefore it is not the truth. So see how logical that sounds? but how completely false it is. So lesson, do not rely on your own logic. Do not be stunned or uh, impressed by the logic of those who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of how many degrees and how many initials they have at the, uh, you know, after their names. If one has not recognized their Lord and tried to give him his rights and they remain the most ignorant of people, uh, regardless of, um, how much education they may appear to have, right? So, Nuh people who rejected him, 
It's like they were saying, as Mobuli writes, you claim that you have favored the favored ones of God whose blessings are on you and that those who do not follow your way are under his wrath. But the reverse of this is true, for if it is we who have been favored by wealth, by servants, power, you have nothing of this sort. Point out anything in which you are superior to us, right? Um, so throughout the ages, this has been the attitude of those whose pockets are full, but hearts and minds are empty, as Qutub eloquently states. So the pitfall, the takeaway lesson from this, uh, and there are many, many lessons, these are some of the pitfalls, not all of them, these are just some of the pitfalls of relying too much, having too much confidence on your own intellect. Don't rely on your own intellect. I disagree. I don't think that's right. But in my opinion, part of humility, which is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to become quiet and consider the truth instead of uh, expressing one's own opinions and reasons for disagreement. Because the worst of people uh, used to do that, those who rejected their prophets, right? So we have to be really careful to not have incorrect markers of success and righteousness, okay? Incorrect markers of success, you know, wealth can be an incorrect marker of success, right? Um, to not think someone is righteous because of A or B, to not think someone is on the true path because of their poverty or anything, right? So never be deluded by um, by wealth or status or power, etc. And subhanAllah, I was remembering um, what Muhammad al-Sharif, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, um, this is somewhat, uh, somewhat related, not directly related, is how ultimately your career is not going to matter. SubhanAllah, I was listening to, I'm sure most of you have heard um, his five lessons to live a full life. And I think this is point number two, where he mentions how ultimately your career will not matter. And I think one of the reasons he has been so powerful uh, these last few weeks uh, after his death, perhaps even more so than he was in his lifetime, is because he actually lived his life according to what he taught and we see how uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him such a beautiful khatima, right? How he, uh, his last deed was praying salat, right? He collapsed in the prayer. Allah blessed him with such a husn khatima, subhanAllah, which is such a good sign, such a good end. And we see through his example of what kind of life, beautiful, full, enjoyable, hayatun tayyiba, pure life, you can really lead um you know when you when you follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you know what's really important and one of the things he mentioned which is so uh rare to hear even among muslim circles something he said is ultimately your career will not matter what will matter is if you were really abdullah or amatullah as he said that's the only thing that's going to matter it doesn't matter if you were a janitor or if you were a surgeon right or a president of the of your country What's really going to matter is if you had recognized your greatest identity, which is the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tried to live according to that, right? That is your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most important thing, is the only thing that matters um, when the dust settles on our graves and everyone walks away and we're alone in our, and at that moment, which all of us are going to go through, um, subhanAllah, no one can escape it. Uh, the other day we were discussing risk factors for uh, certain uh, diseases. Someone in our community just had a stroke. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nurse uh, them back to health. So we're discussing various risk factors for things like stroke, etc. And I said, SubhanAllah, you know, the greatest risk factor, um, you know, for death is really being alive, right? The fact that you are alive is the greatest risk factor for death because nothing is guaranteed in this dunya except death, right? So it's just the fact that you're alive, you're, you're going to die, right? Um, so, and we don't know when that's going to happen, subhanAllah. So really nurture your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day. And one of the greatest blockers to nurturing our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are all the distractions and the petty entertainments or distractions or frivolity that has now pervaded our social media space, our minds, our lives. 
Muslims are not supposed to be petty people concerned with petty things or how to entertain themselves today or what's the best meal I can eat, what's the most, how can I have the most fun? These are not supposed to be the concerns we wake up with, right? We are supposed to be have ma'ali al-umur, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves for us ma'ali al-umur, yani he loves for us great, exalted, noble aims, right? Again, something we learn from our beloved Muhammad al-Sharif, rahimahullah ta'ala. Think big, dua big, have big goals. Don't lead a normal life. You know, do something that will outlive you. Create a legacy, right? Um, okay, let's look at verse number 28. Allah, he said, Yani Nu Islam said, Ya Qawmi, O my people, Ara'aytum. Have you considered in if kuntu, if I was ala upon bayina, a clear path or a clear way or a clear proof, a clear evidence? It has all of those meanings. Min from Rabbi, my Lord, wa atani, and he has given me rahma, mercy, min from Andihi himself. Fa'umiyat. So it has become blinded alaykum upon you. Yani, you have been blinded. So you can't see it. Anulzimukumuha. Shall I force it upon you? Wa and antum you. Laha with regards to it or for it. Karihu. Hate it. Uh, hateful in the plural form. Verse 28. No, some said, My people, if I base myself on a clear evidence from my Lord. And I have also been blessed by his mercy, to which you have been blind. How can we force it upon you despite your aversion to it? Okay, so this is uh, very similar to what we have already uh, studied in verse 17 of this surah. So please um, refer to that on your own later. So no one I'm here is saying, uh, oh my people, and amazing how in spite of the rejection, he's so loving in his speech towards them. Ya qawmi, my people, oh my people. You know, he's so patient and so loving and so polite and, and sympathetic in his tone to them. Oh, my people, will we just consider, you know, will we just take a moment to think that if I am upon bayira, upon a dalil, upon an evidence, a certain clear path, you know, and uh, God has given me a special mercy from himself, right, the revelation. But you just can't see it. You just can't see it. You're so blinded to it. Shall I then force it over you while you hate it, right? Um, and we're going to get into what that means, subhanAllah, it's so much in this verse. Maldud, he mentions that Nuh alayhi salam is saying that, you know, I recognize the reality of Tawheed by looking at the universe, by looking at my own self. And then Allah confirmed that with the revelation that he uh, gave me, right? So Maldud, he makes the point how all the prophets, um, you know, will go through this process of observation and contemplation by which they become aware of the greater realities and truth even before revelation comes to them. But then when Allah gives them that revelation, that mercy from himself, then they get the actual knowledge, right? Uh, then they know how to pray, how to fast, and uh, you know, what, how to proceed. Um, okay, now I wanna talk about blindness. I want us to imagine two people looking at a beautiful scene, okay? You can close your eyes. Two people are looking at a beautiful scene. There's a flowing blue brook. There are red mountains in the back. Green birds are chirping. And one person looks at it and says, SubhanAllah. And you know, their heart rejoices at the beauty of the scene and the clarity of the view. And it makes you know, them love their Lord all over again. And there's another person standing there looking at the same view. So these two people are in the same place at the same time together. But the second individual is deaf and is colorblind. So they see no beauty in the colors. They can't distinguish between the red and the green and the blue, right? And they're unable to enjoy the melodious tune of the birds, you know, because of these impairments that they have. Although the same scene is in front of them, but because of these physical limitations or physical impairments, uh, the, they are unable to see what is right in front of them. So physical disabilities, of course, have no bearing on Iman, but spiritual ones certainly do. And it is a spiritual blindness that Nuh alayhi salam is talking about here. When one shuns the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the heart becomes blind. The heart 
is unable to do its job, which is not just to beat, to live for this life, but it is to be able to distinguish between right and wrong for the next life. Allah says in Surah Fatir, verse 8, أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوْ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا And as for the one who his evil deeds have been made beautiful to him, so he sees it as something good. This verse exposes how the heart can become so blind to the point that you are doing something so ugly in the sight of Allah, yet you think it to be so good. You think you're doing the right thing, the good thing, even the pleasing thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is an indication of the blindness of the heart. We seek Allah's refuge from the blindness of the heart, which is so much worse than just physically uh, being blind. So what are some indications of having a physically, uh, a spiritually blind heart or a partially blind heart, uh, partially spiritually blind heart? How do you feel when you hear the recitation of the Quran? What feelings do you feel? What emotions do you feel? Do you feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does your heart feel like it's getting softer? Do you want to keep hearing the recitation or do you want to turn it off? SubhanAllah, you know, some hear the Quran and their heart melts. And others would hear the Quran and they would say something so repulsive, like uh, in Surah Al-Anfal, verse 31, and when our signs are recited upon them, they say, oh, we have heard. If we wanted, we could have said the same thing. It's just, you know, old stories. The stories of ancient, uh, you know, ancient tales. So subhanAllah, you see how the path is the same path. The scene is the same scene. And it can be crystal clear for one group, but completely confounding and does not make sense for another group. And it all goes back to the acuteness of their sensibilities. In this case, what is the difference between the two? One who sees and enjoys the beauty and that is in front of her and says, SubhanAllah, and the other who is blind and you know does not know what the big deal is? The answer lies in the state of the heart. Ibn Kathir uh, explains you know, the bayina that uh, Nuh alayhi salam references here in verse 28. You can see it on your screen. He said, oh, my people, you know, consider, just consider, just think for a moment, what if I am upon a bayina? What if, you know, you think it's not true, but what if it is true? What if I am on this bayina? Ibn Kathir says it is certainty or a clear matter or true prophethood, right, etc. And it has been blinded, you have been blinded, or it's obscured from your sight. It's hidden from you. It's there, clear and plain as day, but you don't recognize it. And so you were quick in dismissing it. This is another point I want to make. And I've said this before. It's really easy to dismiss something that you don't want to accept. Really easy to, you know, just wave away, dismiss, shoo away something, an idea, a concept, a command, a prohibition in Islam that forces us to change our lifestyles forces us to act differently. It's really easy to just dismiss it and not think about it. But that is not how you become guided. Guidance is enforcing yourself to consider the truth and to do so in a humble way. And always keep an open mind and think the truth may be with the other side and not with your own self. This is what Nuh salam is trying to make his people think about. Just think, O oh my people, if I am upon the truth. And you you just can't see it. You know, are we gonna force you? No, we're not gonna force you, right? So uh, Qutb mentions how he addresses people, his people with kindness and friendliness, and this shows his relationship to them, right? And he wants to tell them, listen, I have a relationship with my Lord. That is crystal clear to me. And you just don't have that relationship. But what if God has really blessed me with the revelation? He has chosen me to carry his message 
but you are just not open-minded to consider this possibility. Well, guess what? We're not going to force you. If you hate it so much, we are not going to force you because Nuh al Islam here is cautioning him about uh, cautioning them about their spiritual blindness, which of course, like we said, is far more tragic, has a far more tragic end than physical blindness. If physically someone is blind, but they're a believer, they're going to be resurrected with full sight. And by the way, the senses in Akhirah are magnified, bionic um, senses that we don't have in this world. So when the way we'll be able to see in Jannah is not the way we see in dunya, even if it's like 2020 vision that we have, right? It's going to be a whole different realm of being able to see in a way that we do not see over here. It's going to be a way of smelling and sensing and eating. And, you know, the pleasure level in paradise is indescribable. And really, it's all about pleasure and having fun and, you know, being in gardens of eternal delight and bliss. So people who want to have fun, uh, use that desire that you have to have fun and make it eternal. Make sure you have fun forever. Eternalize that. And that's actually why Allah has given us this um, sense of taste, uh, sense of wanting to live a long life. Everyone has this desire uh, to love youthfulness. Everyone wants to always be young. Um, to, you know, all of these desires in the human being are there so that we can long for their eternalization and thus long to be in a world, to work for a world where these things will be eternally available to us, where we will be young and never get old, where our clothes will never fade, right? Where we'll never, uh, you know, um, stop, uh, you know, desiring uh, the various pleasures of paradise, subhanAllah. So really, this is how we have to look at the at things that delight us in this world. They're like someone said, they're like the trailers, all the food and all the fun and all the pleasure and all the beauty of this dunya. And subhanAllah, some places you look at them that Allah has created in this world and they take your breath away. We want to be, we want our breath taken away forever, right? Like uh, in the sense that we want to be in the breathtaking uh, palaces of paradise like how can someone not want that how and then how could anyone think that you cannot buy a house in this world except by working hard but we can get the palace of paradise without working you know like be logical think and don't just waste uh, days in frivolity and uh without goals and without demanding something for yourself to show for that day so that if that day was your last day, you had something to show for it. So SubhanAllah, but if you don't want to, then there's no, no one's going to force you, right? You have the choice to remain fully blind spiritually if you want. Nu is not going to force you. The prophets have not forced their people. Allah does not force anyone, right? And SubhanAllah, Qutb mentions how Nuh salam establishes the right principle that faith must be based on conviction, not by being forced. Where do you get conviction from? By study and reflection. And this is one of the tragedies of our time is that people have stopped studying, people have stopped learning, have stopped reading, have stopped reflecting, right? Because um, our distractions uh, you know, a great factor of that is social media usage has really robbed our minds of the ability to stop, think, ponder, reflect. We don't have those capabilities anymore, which is why many of you know that the producers of, you know, social media and various technologies are the same people that do not allow their children to use them because they know how it affects the mind to the point that your mind is taken, but you don't know that you've been taken. Your mind is thinking, 
in the way that they want you to think or begin, gets used to a certain pattern of thinking, a certain pattern of responding so that you don't know how to think and process outside of those limited parameters. So really, you know, we are in a technological slash distraction crisis. We're just taking over, you know, not just storage in our phones, but the space in our minds. And the mind is a limited uh, organ. The more space is taken by other things, the less room there is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his words, contemplating his words. How many hours do you have in a day? After a few hours of doing something, you get tired. The way you feel in the evening is not the way you feel in the morning, right? Um, we have such limited time. We must give the best of us, the most uh, fresh, um, the most energetic part of us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to his deen, right? So put the mentions out. Um, conviction is the result of study and reflection, compulsion, yani forcing someone. This has nothing to do with iman. This has nothing to do with, you know, um, because you cannot force anyone to love Islam. You cannot insert it into anyone's heart. And it's not going to be changed for them to suit their liking, right? We don't worship Allah on our terms. We worship Allah on his terms. So who, who wants it? Let him take it as it is, as pure as God made it, end quote. So... The lesson here and something that even um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was so grieved by the fact that Abu Talib would not become Muslim. So sad that his beloved uncle who supported him so much was so nice to him, was so kind to him, was so caring like a father to him, uh, would did not become Muslim. This was such a cause of deep pain for the Rasul. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah had to tell him, right, or told him that, you know, yeah. um, you cannot guide whom you love. Allah guides whom he wills, right? You cannot make anyone believe or become better Muslims or change, or, no matter how badly you want that for them, how badly your heart bleeds for them, how badly your heart is broken on account of that. You, you can't any more than you can force someone to love you. Can you force anyone to love you if someone really doesn't like you? Someone doesn't love you. Can you force someone to love you? No, there, there's no sway upon the heart. SubhanAllah, the heart has a life and a force of its own. If it is guided, if it is salim, if it is good and sound, then it is the most powerful aid to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a most powerful guide to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if the qalbun salim, uh, if it is not qalbun salim, if it is not a sound heart, if it is corrupted, if it has incorrect ideas, then it spells doom for its companion, yani for the person. Okay, and the hadith is in Bukhari Muslim, where the Rasul said, Ala wa inna fil jasadi mudwa, ida salahat salaha jasad kullu, wa ida fasad fasad al jasad kullu, ala wa hil qalb. Beware there is a piece of flesh in the body. If it becomes good, the whole body becomes good. But if it gets spoiled, the whole body gets spoiled, and that is the heart. So the heart is the most critical organ. As long as it beats, we are alive. And as long as it is sound, according to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it loves what Allah loves. It hates what Allah hates. It rushes to what uh, you know, is pleasing to Allah, it shirks away from what is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes a source of eternal life, right? SubhanAllah, the heart is an amazing creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, let's look at verse 29. And all my people, la, I do not as'alukum, ask you alayhi, because of it or for it, mala any type of mal or uh, financial recompense. In ajriya, but my reward, illa except Allah upon Allah. Wama and I, 
وما يعني I'm not so أنا وما أنا and I am not بطارد الذين driving away الذين those آمنوا who have believed إنهم indeed they ملاقو are meeting ربهم their Lord ولكني but I see أراكم I see you but I see you قوما as a people تجهلون who are ignorant verse 29 my people I seek no recompense from you, my recompense is only with Allah, nor will I drive away those who believe they are destined to meet their Lord, but I find you to be an ignorant people. Verse 29. Now, here, Anwal Islam starts off by saying, I'm not asking for any money for this, for what I'm doing, right? Of course, the station of prophethood is above asking anyone, uh, anything from the people, right? It is too sincere, too dignified. Um, it is fully reliant. Right, station of Prophet of Nabuwa, prophets are fully reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's obviously no question of getting any type of uh, money from the people for what they are doing. Uh, this, the work is for Allah and the recompense, the ajr, reward is hoped from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, here, here in Nawal Islam is clarifying to the people, listen, I have no hidden agenda. I'm not asking you for money. I'm just calling you to the worship of one God, right? Um, this is sincerely and only for you, your akhara, your welfare. There is no selfish motive, right? I'm not expecting to get anything uh, out of this for my own uh, self, going through all this suffering, going through you know everything that he went through for such an extended period of time. And just this point is something that should have made the people of Nuala Islam think deeply, think about, they should have thought about this uh, about the prophetic call properly. They should, you know, said to themselves, look, this man has been calling us for several centuries, you know, several centuries, not a day or two, not a week or two, not a year or two, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, right? 950 years. I mean, we don't even understand what kind of sabr goes into 950 years of calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not having many followers at the end of it. They all fit in the boat at the end, right? So, by the way, this is the best thing to be. If some of you are thinking about college or careers or what to do with your life, uh, there is nothing better than calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no better resume uh, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than to be like the prophets were in the sense of continuing their mission of calling others to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling to God, reminding people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the best way that we can spend our days and our nights, right? Um, because in Allah's sight, these are the best of people. And the best of creation, the prophets did exactly that. So they should have thought about that. They should have thought about the fact that he has been calling us for several centuries now to the worship of one God without asking for anything in return he's not asking us for a single any type of recompense which means he's not working for this world he's working for another realm we should consider that what if he has been telling the truth for hundreds of years for he has not demanded any type of recompense and he has the finest character only the truth only the haq can inspire such exhaustive breathtaking effort that Nuh Islam put forth. He is of the Ulul Azim. He is one of the five great prophets of Islam, right? One of the greatest prophets that ever lived. And they rejected him, right? So arrogant, blind people who did not submit to the truth, they wanted Nuh Islam to reject um, the believers. This is what is mentioned here in this verse. After he says that I'm not asking for anything, uh, and I, and by the way, I'm not going to drive away those people uh, that have believed. So if you look at the verse on the screen, verse 29, Qarid is to push away, to drive away with contempt, to look at someone as lowly and to look at them with hatefulness and you know contempt, and out of that spirit to drive them away, right? But Subhanallah. Nuhulay said, I'm not going to do that. They wanted him to not have 
the low poor believers in the same gathering as them. That was one of their conditions to listen to Nuh son, get these people out of here. And you know, then perhaps they thought, they thought themselves too important. So you see again, the many manifestations, the many harms, the, the doom that they met on account of uh, thinking of themselves as uh, people of you know, worth and uh, self-admiration. This is one of the worst qualities to have is to think highly of yourself. The opposite of that is humility. So humility, which was our reflection question last week, and we talked about some of its benefits, here, another benefit is that it makes you more likely to see the truth. It makes you more likely to see the reality for what it is. Okay, it gives you basira. It gives you the sight of the heart, right? Um, so humility is uh, obviously what they were lacking. And this is exactly, by the way, what the Quraysh used to say to the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that, you know, um, we don't, we're not going to sit with these uh, poor people that have believed and you with these people who have no worth in our sight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Rasul وسلم, the same thing in Surah Al-Na'am verse 52. O Prophet, do not dismiss or drive away those poor believers who invoke their Lord morning and evening, seeking his pleasure. So, so same word, same as Tarid, right? This is different forms. Um, so worth in the sight of Allah comes from how much we remember Allah. الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي O Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do not drive away those people, even though the Quraysh are asking for this and, you know, maybe if you listen to them, they would come and consider your message. No, we don't think like that. We don't uh, give worth to people who have no worth. Um, in the sight of Allah Subhanahu if they are, you know, uh, arrogant, persistently arrogant and stubborn in their rejection and make um, unjustifiable demands like this. What has worth in the sight of Allah Subhanahu wa are those who call upon their Lord morning and evening, seeking his pleasure. These are the people you stay with. These are the people you keep close to you. These are the people you want to get close to. Those who remember Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala morning and evening, seeking his pleasure, wanting to please him, right? Those are the kinds of friends you should make. That's the kind of company you should keep. And in every majlis, in every gathering, every time you see your friends, your family, try to make an effort to remind people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that is becoming so unpopular in our times. So you see the uh, unpopularity of those things which provide life to the heart. Life to the heart comes through remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even in, in gatherings of entertainment and fun and relaxation and hanging out, there should be something that, you know, we say or remind each other or uh, mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that gathering does not become a source of regret for us on the Day of Judgment. Because every um, opportunity that we lose to remember uh, Allah, where we could have remembered him, turns into regret on the Day of Judgment, right? So remind each other, have, you know, try to raise, uh, you know, the state of the ummah, the state of our gatherings, try to raise them up from frivolity and uselessness and just lahu and lahu, you know, just useless talk, vain speech, things that have no benefit, you know, just spend the whole time simply, you know, chatting and laughing. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it should not just be that. It should be enriching. Every time you meet someone, you see someone, they should benefit from you. You should be able to give some nasiha, good, good advice. What happened to nasiha? Nasiha is going extinct, right? Just, you know, a generation ago, we, uh, we, you know, we were so much more focused on it than we are now. Now it's such a superficial level of interaction, even with those you feel the most comfortable with are the closest to. There is no nasiha, there's no reminding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no commanding the good, forbidding the evil, you know, but then we have to be look at how much khair do I want for this, these people who I consider to be so close to, yet I do not remind them of that which will benefit them the most, that will benefit me and my heart the most, right? So we are to not drive away. In other words, we are to be with people who call upon the Lord morning and evening. So there's something to uh, bring back to our majalis, to our gatherings. 
So here, Noah Islam says, I'm not going to do this. Whether you believe or not, it's up to you. I'm not going to drive away these poor people who have believed and therefore are worthy in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But just because you consider them uh, to have no worth and you want me to drive them away, I will never do this because they are about to meet their Lord, inshallah, in a very good way where he is pleased with them, inshallah. But you are acting wa antum araakum qawman tajhalun. You are acting like jahil people, right? What is jahil? You know, uh, someone who's ignorant, someone who doesn't act the way that they're supposed to be acting, right? Someone who's not reacting, acting, responding, behaving the way they should be according to the circumstance, according to the situation. So you are acting in a way that is doom and detrimental to your final return. Whereas these people, as, as Maududi mentions, they are destined to meet their Lord. Their true worth will be known only when they shall meet their Lord. It's not proper for you to treat them with hate here in this world. And perhaps they are precious stones their Lord alone knows. And you are treating them as something worthless, right? So he was very clear on this. No, it sounds like there's no way that I'm going to... Um, you know, reject them or kick them out of my uh, gatherings. Uh, you know, they have believed and you are people who are tajhalun. You are acting as if you have no awareness of right and wrong. And if you act that way, then you become that. If you act jahil long enough, you become jahil, right? Um, right? As the saying goes that, how does someone become knowledgeable? By learning, there's no secret there's no magic pill there's no shortcut you become knowledgeable by the process of learning and and you become forbearing and you know forgiving and patient by practicing that right so sometimes people think that you know why should i behave in a way that is not natural to me or behave in a way that i don't feel well if you're if you don't have a natural Tendency, tendency to certain good qualities that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you practice them, right? Um, like Muhammad al-Sharif said, Allah ta'ala, is that, you know, success is not an accident. It's something that is engineered, right? I'm paraphrasing what I recall from his quote. You have to engineer um, qualities of khair. Everyone is not born with, uh, you know, amazing, virtuous, righteous qualities. They have to be cultivated. They have to be uh, nurtured. Uh, and it all starts with becoming aware of where we are lacking and then, you know, taking the steps necessary. So they are tajhalun. They are um, acting ignorantly, right? You are acting ignorantly. He's talking to his people. And the ones you are considering the lowliest of you, they, well, they're the ones who responded positively to my call. And since I'm not seeking any type of financial gain from you, I'm not going to favor the rich over the poor. So Nu uh, as Qutb points out these um, things that I just mentioned, SubhanAllah, really, he's, Nu is very clear on um, who matters, what matters, and he will not act in a way to please these uh, people who have rejected him, rejected the truth. So SubhanAllah, you know, this is um, what we learn from our uh, messengers, uh, from the, the sunnah of our messengers, the sunnah of Nuh alayhi salam. Don't ever treat someone differently or lesser because of their financial status. Um, that is not a consideration for us as believers. We should seek out those people who seem to have those qualities that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we can benefit from their company. And of course, we can only go by what we see outwardly. And of course, the, their inner reality is known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we make this dua that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our inner realities far better than our outer appearances. May we be so much more precious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of what is inside more than what you know people can see on the outside. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our um, asrar, uh, our secrets, um, inshallah, better and greater uh, in his sight than our outward appearances. 
So we're going to actually conclude with verse 29. Uh, and we'll uh, continue, inshallah, because time has run out. And we'll continue, inshallah, next week with verse 30. Jazakumallah khairan for attending. Hope to see all of you. Mm -hmm.